So my title is Controversial Stimuli. You've just heard it, Optimizing Experiments to Adjudicate Among Computational Hypotheses. So this is a little different from um, uh, approaches to explainable AI that you have heard about uh, in this workshop. And I want to talk a little bit about the, the difference between what we're talking about here and, and XAI as conventionally conceived. Um, so neural network models and explanation, conventional XAI goals, as I understand them, are to build explanations for the behavior of neural network models and to build models that predict in ways that inherently can be understood by people. What I'm going to be talking about today is uh, in the realm of computational neuroscience, where we build neural network models of the information processing in brains. So those are not sort of models of uh, relationships in the domain that we apply our models to or, or train them with, but they're supposed to be uh, abstract models of the information processing that we think is going on in, for example, a human brain or the brain of a monkey uh, doing a task such as visual recognition of, of images. And then the insight comes through inferential comparisons using brain and behavioral data among competing models that differ in architecture, objective, or learning rule. So it's not so much about uh, building the models in a way that makes them uh, easier to understand. Uh, we want the models to uh, be connectionists, have lots of connections like biological brains. So in a, in a sense, uh, what is the, the bug is a feature here. Um, these neural network models are inspired by brains, they're complex like brains, they're connectionist, and therefore we think they're potentially good models of how brains process information. Um, but the insight comes through inferential comparisons in the light of scientific data, measurements of brain activity, measurements of behavioral responses, between different neural network models that can be qualitatively different. For example, we might have a feedforward network and we might have a recurrent network and they might be trained on the same visual task. And then we compare these, these as models of the processing in biological brains. And we hope to make scientific um, progress through these inferential model comparisons. So this is the... Um, the general approach that I'll be talking about. And in particular, um, we are interested in uh, using controversial stimuli. Um, and that's a, a particular concept that we've been developing, which is all about optimizing our experiments, our visual experiments, to adjudicate among computational hypotheses. So I want to make sure conceptually um, this is very clear. As, as scientists, uh, scientists always want to design experiments, of course, to adjudicate among competing theories. And what's special for us is we're perceptual neuroscientists. And uh, so experimental design for us usually involves a choice of stimuli. So optimizing our experiments involves making choosing stimuli or designing stimuli that are well suited for adjudicating among uh, the theories we're interested in testing. And those theories um, in, in our lab tend to be implemented in neural network models. When our hypotheses are implemented in brain computational models, we may need optimization techniques to make stimuli that elicit distinct predictions from different models. And this is in contrast to uh, maybe an old, older uh, tradition of perception science where we we had theories that were sort of defined at a verbal level and we could just come up with stimuli that were obviously well suited for adjudicating among the theories. Now that our theories are uh, implemented in these really complex neural network models, it's no longer obvious what our stimuli should look like to give us a lot of power to adjudicate between these models um, with our data. And this is where controversial stimuli come in. The definition of controversial 
uh, stimuli is this last phrase here, stimuli that elicit distinct predictions from different models. So um, these stimuli are controversial between two models or among a, a set of models. They're not necessarily controversial between people at all, right? The idea of controversiality is that different models uh, make different predictions for these stimuli. So to motivate this a little bit more, I want to give two examples from, of experiments in my lab where we did not use controversial stimuli. And these two example studies illustrate the limits of using just random selections of stimuli or natural stimuli. In the first example, um, we were interested in explaining human face dissimilarity judgments. And uh, Camilla Jotzbrek, Catherine Storrs, and Jonathan O'Keefe in the lab conducted an experiment where they showed faces generated with a face graphics model, the Basel face space model. And they uh, sampled systematically uh, pairs of faces in this face space that spanned particular angles in this uh, in this face graphics space, which has a latent space of faces, which is derived by PCA from 3D scans of actual human faces. In this latent space, they sampled a certain uh, range of angles and combinations of radii from the, the center of the face space, which is the average face, uh, in order to generate a number of uh, face pairs. And then they asked uh, subjects, human subjects, in an experiment to arrange these face pairs on a computer screen by their dissimilarity. So they were shown all these, these face pairs on the screen. This was a touch screen and they could drag these faces to different vertical positions to indicate how dissimilar they perceived these, these faces to be. And uh, our uh, goal was to try to explain these face dissimilarity judgments with computational models. We had a wide range of, of models that we contrasted. These included image computable neural network models of so the VGG architecture and the AlexNet architecture. So, so smallish um, uh, models with a number of stages that's much smaller than the computer vision state of the art, but closer to the, the primate uh, visual hierarchy in the ventral stream. And we also included some uh, classical computer vision features like, like GIST and some higher level descriptions of the faces like the latent space vectors and the Basel face space model uh, uh, among our candidate models here. And we plotted the model accuracy, um, which we, we measured as a Pearson correlation of the representational dissimilarities in these models with the perceptual dissimilarities. And what we see here is that there are uh, a number of models that come very close to the noise ceiling, which is defined by the noise in the uh, human behavioral data and the intersubject variability. So there's a number of models here, these, these first six models here, that are all indistinguishable from the lower bound of the noise ceiling. So these are models that are quite good at explaining our behavioral uh, face dissimilarity judgments. And they include these image computable models of so the VGG architecture trained on face identification or object recognition, AlexNet architecture, but also um, the GIST uh, feature set and these different subsets of the Basel face space latent model. So one thing that's, that's apparent here is that we have extremely qualitatively different models here that all make uh, closely related predictions and cannot be uh, uh, statistically distinguished uh, for, for this data set. There were some other models that um, did not do very well here. Um, so, you know, we did learn something from this model comparison exercise, but um, a clear limitation is that there are very qualitatively different models that we cannot distinguish. So why can't we distinguish these models we think that it's despite the distinct mechanisms in these models, these models make similar predictions for natural or synthetic faces that are not chosen expressly to discriminate among the models. 
So this is one one example of the limitations of using uh, just random sets of stimuli in these kinds of experiments. Here's another example in which uh, Catherine Storrs found that diver diverse uh, deep net architectures all explain the human inferior temporal representation similarly well. So uh, Kate used a number of uh, classical computer vision architectures and compared their internal representations to the representational space in human inferior temporal cortex as measured with functional magnetic resonance imaging by comparing the representational dissimilarity matrix for a set of little object images. So these are uh, some matrix of distances in the multivariate representational space with one distance for every pair of stimuli. So that's a characterization of the representational geometry. We use each of these deep net models to predict a representational geometry and then compare that to the representational geometry that we measured in, in uh, the humans. Again, we have a noise ceiling here and we can look at each of these architectures and we looked at different versions for each of the architectures namely untrained and trained and fitted and unfitted. Training refers to training on the task of object categorization and fitting refers to fitting to explain the human IT representational geometry. And we find that both training and fitting uh, help make the match to the, the human IT representational geometry better. And if we uh, train the networks on the object recognition task, and we fit it to best explain um, the representational geometry in the human brain, and we do a little bit better. All of this is cross-validated uh, uh, on different images. So, you know, this is generalization performance of predicting the representational geometry in human IT for different images. So we can do this uh, for each of these architectures. And when we do this, we find uh, for us, uh, uh, disappointingly, that all of these very qualitatively different architectures perform about, about equally well at explaining the human IT representational um, geometry. Notably, all these models are trained and tested on natural images. And we think that it's the shared features of these models, the deep hierarchy that they all share and the convolutional architecture that they all share, that explains the relative success of these models. Why can't we distinguish the models? We think that it's that each model's parameter space is too expressive. Each of these models is uh, a universal approximator. For the distinct inductive biases that these models do have due to their different architectures to be revealed when we're training and testing on natural images and fitting to brain activity data. So these are two uh, examples of cases where we really need optimized experiments in order to adjudicate among models. So in general, we're um, faced with the question of how we can achieve theoretical progress with these really high parametric neural network models. On the one hand, neural networks provide a language for expressing particular hypotheses about brain computation. Um, on the other hand, their high parametric complexity is both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing in that the high capacity for knowledge enables us to capture intelligent behaviors such as recognition of, of images, uh, recognition of objects and, and natural images, which just requires a lot of knowledge about what things look like. And so, you know, in order to, to model visual recognition, we need models that have high parametric capacity. Um, however, the high parametric complexity is also a curse because the high flexibility of these models makes them, uh, makes it hard for us to adjudicate between them. So our answer to this, this question, uh, whether we can still use these models despite their great flexibility for making theoretical progress is yes, we can use them, but we do need severe tests of out of distribution generalization to elicit such models inductive biases and be able to 
um, see differences in performance between these models. So this is where um, controversial uh, stimuli come in. And this is a line of research that was driven in the lab by uh, Tal Golan, who's now a professor at Ben Gurion University in, in Israel. Uh, and Tal had two key uh, insights that motivated this, this line, line of research. First insight was that to elicit models distinct inductive biases, we can test models on a population of stimuli not used in training, so out of distribution. These could be natural stimuli, for example, stimuli drawn from different stimulus populations, for example, different categories of stimuli that were not used in training, or they could be synthetic stimuli, stimuli optimized in some way to elicit bolder predictions from a given model. And the second insight was that since our goal is to adjudicate among models, um, we might as well create synthetic stimuli that are optimized directly to elicit distinct predictions from different models. And these are what we call controversial stimuli that are controversial among different models. So this is in contrast to another stimulus synthesis uh, approach that's exciting and that has recently been used by a number of, of other labs. And that's the approach of using maximally exciting stimuli. So in this approach, you look at a particular unit in a neural network or at a layer and uh, use optimization techniques to create stimuli that very strongly um, drive that particular unit. And this is uh, an approach that's, that's exciting because you can uh, derive super stimuli for particular units that will drive that unit more strongly than natural stimuli do. And this uh, creates a strong prediction. Uh, so the model predicts that these, these stimuli created on the basis of the model will also drive uh, strong responses in the biological brain in, in question. And this would be a sort of uh, uh, a bold prediction and therefore provides potentially for a severe test of one particular model. What we're talking about here is, is different in that in controversial stimuli, the stimuli are always controversial uh, between at least two models, right? So we have two models. We have some kind of uh, measure of controversiality, which we have to define, and I'll define uh, a particular measure uh, in a moment. And then we optimize uh, a single image or a set of images jointly in order to maximize that controversiality um, between the models. We wanted to start small here. So we started with the, the MNIST uh, data set of small handwritten digits. And this enabled us to test uh, a wide variety of qualitatively different models. So we had feed forward models and we had recurrent models and we had models that were generative and that they uh, contained uh, uh, probabilistic models of the distribution of stimuli associated with each of the digit classes and discriminative models that learned to map from the bitmap images to the labels of the, the digits. So in each of these quadrants, we had um, different models here as examples. And we wanted to uh, contrast all of these models and then adjudicate among these models when th these models are interpreted as high-level models of human perception. And we wanted to do this adjudication based on human categorizations of images. So humans see, um, see little images and they, they tell us, and I'll, I'll show you this in a, in a moment, they tell us what digits they see in these images. And then we want to be able to adjudicate um, between the models. So um, the controversiality index, uh, therefore, because this was a behavioral study, uh, was based on the categorization behavior of these images. And the controversiality is defined for a given pair of models A and B um, as a function of the image X and uh, is separately defined for each digit pair DA and db. And it's defined as the minimum of these four probabilities here, where um, the first probability is the probability 
assigned by model A to um, the image containing digit DA. So this first probability reflects that model A detects digit A. And uh, so, so what, what we are optimizing here is the minimum of all of these probabilities, meaning that we're ensuring that all four of these probabilities are uh, high. All of them are high, which indicates that model A detects digit A with high confidence and that model A does not detect digit B and that model B detects digit B with high confidence and does not detect digit A. So this is a, a very stringent definition of controversiality between these two models. Model A um, for this controversial image is sure that uh, what it's looking at is digit A and not digit B, and model B is sure that it's looking at digit B and not digit A. We can also look at this as a contrast between um, two assigned probabilities. So for example, for the digit seven and the digit three here along the horizontal axis, I'm gonna plot the difference between the two assigned probabilities by model A. And along the vertical axis, I'm gonna plot the difference between the two probabilities assigned for these two digits by model B. And so then we get uh, these four quadrants here. In these two blue quadrants, the models agree. And these two red quadrants, the models disagree. And when we look at the original MNIST digits, they fall far into these corners here where the models um, uh, agree. And that's because all of these models are capable of correctly classifying the MNIST digits um, as are uh, the human subjects. So this uh, is an illustration for why um, just having people uh, classify the original MNIST digits is not very helpful because uh, all the models will behave very similarly and behave similarly to the humans. So this just ends up um, making it look as though all these models are good models um, of human perception, uh, even though the models all have fundamentally different computational mechanisms. So what we want to do is create these controversial stimuli. And to achieve this, we start from a random stimulus and then optimize iteratively this controversiality index to uh, create digit, uh, to create images like this one, which are controversial um, between the two models. So here's a, an example of a stimulus uh, that model A uh, assigned a high probability to for containing a seven, but not a three. And model B uh, saw a three here, but not a seven. So in this way, we can, uh, we can pit models against each other. So when we uh, pit the capsule net recon against the Madri L2 model, um, we can make uh, a whole matrix of stimuli for each pair of digits, we can make uh, a stimulus uh, such that one of the models assigns uh, uh, a seven, but not a three, and the other a three, but not a seven. By the way, I should mention that these were not, uh, th these had sigmoid outputs, so these models could, uh, uh, these models uh, output a probability for each of the digits, and they could also detect multiple uh, digits in the same in the same stimulus, and this is consistent with with our task in the human subjects. So when we look at a matrix like that, we can ask ourselves whether the labels that we assign to um, these images agree more with the labels assigned of Capsule Net Recon or with the labels assigned by Madri Madri L2. And in this case, uh, the labels assigned by by most of our subjects agreed better with um, the labels assigned by uh, capsule net recon. So, um, you know, you might might be able to experience this. For example, this looks more like a nine, the label assigned by capsule net recon, than like a five, the label assigned by Madri L2. So in this case, uh, capsule net recon was the winner, and we can go on and then pit capsule net recon 
against uh, the Gaussian kernel density estimator model, a very, very simple model. And in this case, most of our subjects here saw um, rows of consistent digits um, where the labels they assigned agreed better with the Gaussian kernel density estimator model. And when we pitted this model against the shot analysis by synthesis model, um, which is an interesting model that contains a, a generative model for each of the digit classes, then uh, uh, the shot model uh, appeared to be more consistent with human behavior in the way that labeled these um, these uh, controversial stimuli. So in this way, for each pair of uh, models, we generated uh, a controversial stimulus for each pair of digits, giving us this really large set of controversial stimuli with which to probe these, these models using human behavioral data. So we, we have this, this set of um, ambiguous stimuli here that uh, contain you know, subsets for which each pair of models makes, makes very contrary predictions. So we're, we're guaranteed to be able to um, adjudicate among these models with behavioral data. So in the behavioral experiment, uh, subjects saw one of these digits at a time and then indicated um, the probability of presence of each of the 10 digits in this image. So in this case, the subject indicated that there was a 75% chance of an eight being present in this image and a 50% chance of a three being present. So as you're noting, they, these, these probabilities do not need to add up to one. And the models likewise had sigmoid outputs, not softmax outputs. This was a behavioral experiment performed online in 30 subjects with uh, a large sample from this, this big set of controversial stimuli that I just uh, showed you. So here's the uh, inferential results. Um, along the horizontal here, you see the human response prediction accuracy, that's Pearson correlation, um, comparing the pattern of responses in the humans to the pattern of responses of each of the networks. And the winning model here was the shot analysis by synthesis model, so a model that contains um, a generative model of all of the, the images. Note that none of the models reaches the noise ceiling defined by the noise in the data and the intersubject variability. So none of these models explain the human data as well as other human data. Um, so there is there is significant variance left to be explained in this human behavioral data set. However, we do see a lot of significant differences. So here. Um, these, these bars, these open and closed circles at the end indicate the significant differences. And we see that this, this short um, analysis by synthesis model significantly dominates all of the other models and the degree to which it can explain the pattern of human um, responses. We look at the best performing three models. We notice that they're all generative models. They all, they're all models that contain some kind of generative uh, image generative com component as part of their perceptual inference computation. So we think that this is you know, a little bit of initial evidence that uh, a, a generative component to the perceptual process is, is a key thing that a, a good model of human perception should have. And that's in contrast to um, the um, dominance in, in computer vision of more feed-forward deep convolutional neural networks. As a next step, we scaled this up to small natural images using the CIFAR 10 set of small images. So here I'm gonna show you a matrix of controversial stimuli. And in this case, it's a single matrix for all of the uh, different models and for one pair of categories, so for um, cat versus horse. So here's a particular stimulus that is controversial between the graph world joint energy model and the one PCN A6 model. And uh, for this stimulus, the graph world joint energy model assigns the label horse with high confidence. 
And uh, the one PCNA6 model assigns the label cat with high, high confidence. And so we can eyeball this and ask ourselves, you know, what does this look like to us? Um, and that tells us whether our perception agrees be better with the graph wool joint energy model or the one PCNA6 model. When we look at the, these first three models here, um, we get these rubbish images. Um, so these are images that don't look like anything to, to human observers, but um, the models are uh, certain that there, there are horses and cats in these images, and it's always in a controversial way, right? So for each of them, for this one, the one PCN thinks there's a horse there, and the uh, white ResNet thinks there's a cat there, and they're both very confident, but um, we don't see anything there. So this provides evidence against both of these models um, enables us to to reject all of these these models that give us these these rubbish images here as models of human perception, and actually these these images are uh, uh, a special case of controversial stimuli that's also known as adversarial stimuli because they're um, they're really they show the the failure of of both of these models. Here's what the stimuli look like for the Angstrom L infinity model. Um, so this seems to sort of slightly dominate these first three models. Um, and here's the Angstrom L2 model, which seems to dominate the, the previous models, including the Angstrom L infinity model. And here's the Gaussian kernel density estimator, which worked quite well for the MNIST data set surprisingly well, given how simple a model it is. But this fails spectacularly here when we scale it up to these small natural images. And the best performing model here uh, on the CIFAR 10 data set was the graph wool joint energy model. So we can can see that you know when we look at these these images in the the lower row here, a lot of them um, look like horses, um, and that agrees with the label assigned by by the graph world joint joint energy model. And here for the cat uh, label, it's also true to some extent that um, you know our subjects. Um, categorizations agreed with uh, the graph world joint energy model. So here are the, the formal results from the psychophysical experiment. Um, we see again this very big gap to the noise ceiling, uh, indicating that this data set leaves much to be explained. So none of the models really is a good model of human perception here. Um, however, um, there are uh, differences, significant differences between the models um, the Gaussian kernel density estimator cannot account for human behavior in this data set. Uh, and the best model was significantly better than the other models was the graph wool joint energy model, which is a hybrid model that combines generative and discriminative uh, elements. Tal is now in the process of scaling this up to, to natural images. So here, just to give you uh, a sense of this, uh, what this looks like when he pits uh, the Inception V3 uh, model against the ResNet uh, 50 model, he gets these um, these stimuli that don't really look like like anything and provide evidence uh, against both of these models as models of human perception. But when he pits these models against adversarially uh, trained uh, deep feed forward convolutional models. Uh, he gets stimuli that seem to have some interesting uh, content consistent with the label assigned by these adversarially uh, trained models, in this case, Weimarana dog. However, when uh, we pit these two adversarially trained models against each other, um, we get uninterpretable uh, sort of more structured uh, rubbish images. Um, so again, they're also when we pit these these adversarially trained models against each other, we we find um, pretty strong evidence against both of these models. 
I'm going to switch gears now and give an example of the approach of controversial stimuli in a totally different domain in language. So in collaboration with Chris Baldassano's lab and uh, PhD student Matthew Siegelmann, um, we tested a range of language models. And these included naive bigram and trigram models uh, based on text corpus frequencies of unique phrases of length n, as well as classical neural network models, recurrent neural network models and long short-term memory neural network models, as well as modern transformer neural network models that use context-dependent embeddings and multiple attention heads. These models all assign probabilities to sentences, and uh, we wanted to test to what extent they capture the probabilities that people assign to sentences in the English language. So we can think of sentence space, uh, sentence space as a discrete probability space. And we can think of each of these models, such as BERT, as assigning high probability to some sentences and low probability to some other sentences. And then when we look at some other uh, model like GPT-2, we get a different distribution over sentence space, where again, we have high probability sentences and low probability sentences according to GPT-2. So there, there is a region here where both models, BERT and GPT-2, agree that a sentence is likely or agree that a sentence is unlikely, and then there are these controversial uh, regions here where one of the models uh, judges that a sentence has high probability while the other model uh, uh, judges that the sentence has low probability. So what Tal and Matt and, and, and Chris did here was they started with a natural sentence N and then they uh, considered flipping each of the words in the sentence. So these were eight word sentences. They picked at random uh, one of the eight positions of the words and then considered exchanging that word for any other word in the dictionary and reevaluating the probability assigned by both of these models. And the goal was to minimize the probability of the sentence according to one of the models, in this case, GPT-2, while keeping the probability according to the other model, in this case, BERT, at least the same, right? So there's this constraint here. As we make these uh, discrete changes in the sentence, the probability according to BERT is supposed to be the same. So we stay on this plateau of high probability for BERT, but we want to minimize the probability according to GPT-2 in this case. And then, of course, we can also do the reverse and minimize the probability according to BERT while keeping the probability according to GPT-2 at least the same. So here's an example of such a, uh, su such a set of sentences. So the natural sentence uh, from a text corpus in this case was, this is the lie you have been sold. So that's a natural sentence. Sentence S1, which has equal probability or higher probability according to BERT and low probability according to GPT-2, is the sentence, this is the week you have been dying. Note that this is grammatically correct, but it's kind of an odd sentence because of its meaning. And GPT-2 uh, seems to have a sense of the, the low probability of the sentence. And when we cap the probability at least the same according to GPT-2 and minimized it according to BERT, um, the sentence that we got was, that is the narrative we have been sold. So that's another perfectly natural uh, sentence that has probably been, been uttered many times. So in this case, uh, our subject's judgments um, were more consistent with uh, GPT-2 than, than BERT, and this is an, is an example of um, using controversial sentences synthesized uh, on the basis of these models in order to adjudicate among the models. The actual uh, task that subjects uh, did looked like this. Um, subjects were asked which sentence they were more likely to encounter in English. Uh, and they were presented with two sentences. And they clicked either on the left or on the right. They also had three different choices uh, for, for confidence. 
somewhat confident, confident, and very confident. But uh, in the results that I'm going to show you in a moment, we didn't use these confidence ratings. We just uh, used the binary decisions of subjects for either one uh, sentence or the other sentence. So when we evaluate these language models, we, we used uh, natural sentences as well as controversial sentences. And we used uh, controversial sentences that were just selected uh, among natural sentences to be controversial among the, the models. And we use the kind of synthetic controversial sentences that I just illustrated to you, um, where we're actually flipping words and we're making new sentences um, in order to uh, get the models to, to disagree in their predictions. So when we just use random natural sentences on this set of, of models, uh, here's uh, the behavioral result. So here's the uh, along the horizontal axis, you have the human choice prediction accuracy. And uh, the gray bar here again is the noise ceiling. So that is based on the uh, consistency between uh, people in making these judgments, um, picking which of two sentences uh, is, is more likely to be encountered in English. And uh, what you see here, 50% um, is chance level because these are binary decisions. And each point here is a separate replication of the experiment using new subjects and new stimuli. So this variability here gives us uh, a sense of the variability across replications of the experiment where we both uh, have a different random draw of stimuli and a different random draw of, of subjects. So that's potentially a good way to do the, the inference in a way that, that suggests that um, you know, our conclusions will generalize to, to replications with new stimuli and new subjects. And what we see here when just using random natural sentences is that there are no significant differences at all between any of these models, despite the fact that we have these, these really uh, relatively more uh, 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 sophisticated models like uh, uh, BERT and Roberta and GPT-2. We don't have the late, latest sort of really big models like GPT-3 uh, in here, um, just these, these simpler ones. But um, these, these relatively more sophisticated ones do not perform significantly better than even um, very naive models like a, a bigram or a trigram model. So this illustrates that using natural sentences for, for this kind of uh, model comparison um, really doesn't just doesn't work at all. When we use uh, controversial sentences, uh, we get a lot of power to uh, adjudicate among models. Uh, many of the models now are significantly below the noise ceiling, as can be seen from these stars here. And there are uh, lots of significant differences um, between the models. Uh, this is an example where the controversial sentences were just sentences chosen from a natural corpus. When we use these synthetic controversial sentences, we, we have even, even more power. And when we um, combine all the data together, then um, this is the result. So here we get really lots of uh, statistical power for adjudicating among models. And um, we see that even the best performing model, which was GPT-2 among this, this limited set of models here, uh, does not reach the, the noise ceiling. So it's significantly below the lower bound of the, the noise ceiling. So um, getting moving toward the conclusion here, uh, there is a continuum between artificial stimuli and natural stimuli. So there is a long uh, debate in the, the literature of uh, vision science uh, uh, as to which type of stimulus is, is better to use in experiments. Artificial stimuli have particular advantages. They're controlled. They are often designed to adjudicate between models. And they're, they're simple, simple and often easier to interpret. Natural stimuli have traditionally been used in vision science uh, because they're more ecologically valid and often more complex, driving responses uh, higher up in the visual hierarchy and therefore uh, providing an important uh, complement to artificial stimuli. We think of controversial stimuli as uh, invading the continuum between 
um, these two poles where we, we have stimuli that are artificial and they are designed um, to adjudicate among models, but they also contain a more complex statistical structure of natural images in a way that reflects what those models have learned from being trained on, on natural stimuli. And we think that that is uh, sort of provides a synthesis between these two approaches in the vision um, sciences literature. So in conclusion, controversial stimuli provide optimized probes for adjudicating among computational hypotheses. They reveal distinct inductive biases of different deep net models. Human vision may rely on a computational mechanism that combines elements of discriminative and generative inference. And current language models differ in their ability to recognize high probability English sentences, but none can fully account for human judgments of the rel relative likeliness of sentences. Thank you very much.